Father, we come before you. We thank you for your word. We look to you, Lord. Ultimately, you told us to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. We also want to pray for those in Lebanon whose lives are now suddenly never going to be the same, those in Gaza whose lives already are never going to be the same, those, Lord, potentially in even Syria or Iran, if this thing just continues to snowball, whose lives will never be the same. Think of Egypt. Lord, we pray from whether it's in Jerusalem or the West Bank or Gaza or Lebanon, Syria, Egypt, or Iran, Lord, we pray for those who are in harm's way and don't even know it, that you would be, and perhaps even here, that you would be showing yourself to them as you promised in dreams and in visions. As we have seen, Lord, in the Middle East, you have been appearing to men and women in closed countries, and many of them are coming to know you personally. And so we ask, Lord, as we see these things ratcheting up, that, Lord, more and more you would truly draw all men and women to yourself, Lord. Have mercy on these people in the midst of this devastation and show us, Lord, how to pray. So thank you for this time in your word and may your church be strengthened. And may our walk with you be sharpened, Lord, as we do honestly see the day approaching. We want to be found without spot or blemish before you. In Jesus' name, amen. For this cause, I, Paul, prisoner of Jesus Christ, chapter 3, for you Gentiles, <clears throat> if you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you, word, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in a few words, whereby when you read you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, that the Gentiles, that be most of us, should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel, that we be equally adopted into God's family as well as the Jews. Wherefore, I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effective working of his power, unto me, whom less than the least of all saints, because he was persecuting the church, is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. We got that far last week, verse 10. To the intent now, that unto principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. What does that mean? Well, you're already waiting for me in 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. While you're getting there, I'll read a little. He said, The trial of your faith being more precious than of gold, that perishes though it be tried with fire, might be found to the praise and the honor and the glory of the appearing of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, whom you have not seen, you love. In whom, though now you see him not yet believing, you rejoice with joy unspeakable, full of glory. Verse 9, 1 Peter 1. If you're, uh, it doesn't make any sense, you're in 2 Peter. Receiving the end of your faith, what is it? The salvation of your souls. Of which salvation the prophets have inquired diligently, they searched, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you. Searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify when it testified beforehand, one, the sufferings of Christ, two, the glory that should follow. Unto whom, the prophets, it was revealed that not unto themselves they didn't understand, but it was unto us they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them which have preached the gospel unto you. Remember, the prophets foretold what the Messiah would do. We talked about it last week. The apostles saw him do it. Put the two testimonies together long before the world basically was formed. God had his plan. He knew. In the course of time, he kept revealing through his prophets, through Israel, what he was going to do. And then he shows up and does it. And the apostles let us know that we have seen it. God himself has died for us, risen again, shed his blood. So unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves the prophets were ministering, but unto us. They ministered the things which are now reported unto you by them which have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Spirit sent down from heaven, 
This gets interesting. Which things the angels desire to look into. Did you know that your acceptance or rejected, rejection of Jesus blows the angelic realm's minds? Help me out with that one, Pastor. Job has a very difficult time. He's basically asking God to explain why he's going through what he's going through. And so in Job chapter 38, God shows up and says, who is this who speaks without words, without counsel, darkens wisdom, basically. Where were you, Job, when I laid the foundations of the earth? Can you declare its measurements? Where were you as I did these things where all the morning stars sang and the sons of God or the angelic realm praised? That's an important clue. Before the earth was without form and void, it appears the angelic realm was created, and it appears the angelic realm was created all at one time. We learn in Ezekiel 28 that Lucifer, that fallen angel, was found in Eden before iniquity was found in him, and he sinned and made those statements. If he would be like the Most High, he would ascend, ascend above the heights of God. He basically would take God's job. In Isaiah 14. So the angelic realm had direct access and knowledge of God for themselves. That's why the lake of fire, we were covering this another, and a few nights ago at home, the kids, the lake of fire was created for the devil and his angels. How many are aware of that? And so the discussion came up. Why is it created for the devil and his angels? Because the devil and his angels had a direct access to and knowledge of God. So when they chose to rebel, they chose for themselves. And so God will hold them accountable for that decision. You and I were not in the Garden of Eden. Anybody here in the Garden of Eden? If you are, we're going to take you out for some questioning. Adam and Eve were there, and our representatives crashed and burned. One commandment, just one, just one job, one job. They crashed and burned. None of you would have ever done that. So because Adam got us into this mess, the Son of God also called the last Adam. If you put your trust in him, will lift you out of this mess and into his presence, where we started. And so redemption comes to us because we were represented by Adam and Eve. We were not present for ourselves. The angelic realm, it's different. They chose for themselves, and they are fixed in that decision. The angels that rebelled are fallen. You know them as demons. The angels that remain faithful, you refer to as angels. They have kept their first beginning rule, dominion, or state. And so as the gospel is going forward and people are having a chance to have their sins forgiven by putting their trust in Jesus, whose life and ministry was foretold and then witnessed by the apostles, put it together and you've got God telling you from the beginning to the end that he did this. And some of you go, meh, wonder what I'll have for lunch. That blows the angelic realm away. How could you throw away such an opportunity to be forgiven? And on the flip side, for those who are forgiven, it also schools the demonic realm. That you've never even seen them, and yet you trusted them, and you believe them. These things are in play as the gospel is being proclaimed. So back to our chapter. To the intent that now unto the principalities, powers, in heavenly places, that's the angelic realm, might be known by the church. They're watching your lives. For the angelic realm, make them happy. For the demonic realm, don't give them content against you. By the church might be known the manifold wisdom of God, according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Look, you know, chapter 1, verse 4 told us, according as he has chosen us in Jesus before the foundation, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us to the adoption of children by Jesus Christ. He knew before he ever had the earth founded or formed what he would do. Adam and Eve in the garden. Satan has rebelled and has now fallen. He's got two potential targets. Which one does he go after? Come on, it's not a trick question. Eve. First Peter writing to us, writing to husbands, tells us to dwell with our wives with wisdom, 
as the weaker vessels. Not maybe physically they're at times not as strong as their husbands, although some of them are. <laughs> Emotionally, God gave women the, the birthing of babies. All right, uh-huh. There'd be no babies if he gave it to men. So just because they're a weaker vessel doesn't mean they're weak. It just means that they're meant to be covered by their husbands. But Satan decides, based on Peter's description, to go after what would be viewed as the more weak vessel and deceives her. And Adam transgressed, and here we are in our mess. So it's interesting to me that when the Lord shows up and begins to question Adam and Eve and then deal with the serpent, it's interesting the first prophecy given is, and I will put enmity between the woman's seed and Satan's minions or followers, his seed. And the woman's seed, you're going to bruise his heel, but in bruising his heel, he is going to crush and destroy, crush your head. So Satan goes after the weaker vessel trying to bring down man and creation, and God will bring from the weaker vessel the one that destroys him entirely. Tell me you don't see God's wisdom. Oh, you want to mess with her? Okay, well, I'm going to use her to bring my son who's going to blow your kingdom up and put you in the lake of fire. Personally, I'm like, yeah, well done, God. According to the eternal purpose, which you purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access to who? God. With confidence by the faith of him. Mm, I don't know if I really feel like I've got boldness. Okay, turn to John's Gospel, chapter 16. John's Gospel, chapter 16. While you're getting there, there's a debate going on among the disciples. We'll catch you up here on this one. Some of his disciples said among themselves, What is this that Jesus says to us? A little while and you will not see me. And again, a little while you will see me. How many understand it now on this side of the cross? Just me. Well, I guess that's... And again, a little while and you shall see me because I go to the Father. And they said, therefore, what is this that he saith? Verse 18, a little while we cannot, a little while we cannot tell what he saith. Now Jesus knew that they were desirous to ask him. And he said unto them, do you inquire among yourselves of what I said a little while and you shall not see me? And again, a little while and you shall see me? The answer is obviously yes. Verily, verily, I say unto you that you shall weep and lament, but the world shall rejoice. And you shall be sorrowful, but your sorrow shall be turned into joy. You see, a woman, when she is in travail or labor, has sorrow because her hour has come. But as soon as she is delivered of the child, she remembereth no more the anguish for the joy that a man, or lady is a daughter, is born into the world. Now you therefore have sorrow, but I will see you again. How many now get it? He's going to die and rise again. I will see you again. And your heart shall rejoice, and your joy no man taketh from you, once they realize he is alive. And in that day you shall ask me nothing. Verily, verily, I say unto you, whatsoever you shall ask the Father in my name, he will give it you. Hitherto you have asked nothing in my name. Ask, and you shall receive, that your joy may be full. This is why when I pray, I will always answer my or end my prayer in, in Jesus' name. Some folks like to pray, you know, in your name we pray. I would suggest you pray in Jesus' name. He said pray in his name. So I pray in Jesus' name. John, same author, writing to us later in chapter 5, verse 14, tells us, if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. So, it would be wise to learn to pray according to God's will in Jesus' name. Well, that's great. How do I do that? You'll learn his word. If you read the word of God, you will very quickly realize how to pray. Question. Does God desire all men to be saved? Yes, and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Absolutely. Does God promise that if you seek first the kingdom of God, all the other things will be added to you? Yes. Does God take any delight in the destruction of the wicked? No, Ezekiel 18. 
See, as you start reading God's word, you actually become equipped on how to pray. And as you begin to pray, knowing that this is in alignment with God's word, then you know what? You are praying according to his will. And so then you got to just sit tight and wait for him to answer, whatever that may be. It could be yes, could be no, or hang on a while. He doesn't tell you how long a while is. But you learn how to pray. And he promises that we ask anything in his name, John again letting us know, according to his will, he hears us. I'm not eloquent. He doesn't need eloquent. That's the strongest way to learn how to pray. Read God's word. Therefore, if you ask anything in my name, ask and you shall receive that your joy may be full. These things have I spoken unto you, verse 25 in Proverbs. But the time cometh when I shall no more speak unto you in Proverbs, but I shall show you plainly of the Father. And at that day you shall ask in my name, and I say unto you that I will pray unto the, um, sorry, and at that day you shall ask in my name, and I say not unto you that I will pray the Father for you, verse 26, for the Father himself loveth you, and because you have loved me and have believed that I came out from God. I came forth from the Father, and I am come into the world, and again I leave the world, and I go to the Father. Then his disciples said unto him, Hey, now speakest thou plainly, and speakest no proverb. Now are we sure that thou knowest all things, and needeth not that any man should ask thee. By this we believe that you came forth from God. And Jesus answered them, Do you now believe? Behold, the hour cometh, and yea, is now come, that you shall be scattered, every man to his own, and shall leave me alone in the garden of Gethsemane. And yet I am not alone, because the Father is with me. These things have I spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace, that in the world you, have, you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world, and if we're in him, then we will overcome this world with him. That's awesome. So, in whom we have boldness. Why do we have boldness? Because the veil is ripped in two, and he told us, whatever we ask the Father in his name, obviously according to his will, he will do it. That's an encouragement to pray. We have boldness. We have access, again, he ripped the veil in two, his blood covers us, with confidence that if we're asking his will, he hears us, by the faith of him. Wherefore, I desire that you faint not in my tribulations, his trouble, for you, which is for your glory. Uh, what tribulations? Look at verse 1. I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ. What's his current trouble? The brother's in jail. You know, like clink, clink. For this cause, I desire you, faint not at my tribulations, which is for your glory. For this cause, I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Wait a second. He's bowing his knees and giving praise because he's in prison. You're thinking, uh, can you help me out with that one? Do you remember when there was a certain disciple there in Damascus, called Ananias. He was praying, and the Lord appeared to him, Ananias, I want you to go to the street called Straight, and you'll find one named Saul of Tarsus. He's praying, he's blind right now. You're gonna go lay your hands on him, he's gonna recover his sight. Ananias is like, Lord, but he's a bad dude. He's go your way, he's a chosen vessel. I'll show him what things he must suffer for my name's sake, and I'm gonna put him before kings and rulers and the Gentiles. He goes, he prays for Saul, Saul gets saved, his his stuff comes off his eyes and all the wonderful things, baptized and beautiful. Many years later, Paul is there in the temple. He's there to bring alms for his nation. We've talked about this. The Jews from Turkey falsely accuse him that he brought Trophimus behind that wall we talked about for two weeks in a row. And a riot ensues. And they're in the process of killing him. When Lysus, the commander, rushes down, breaks up the fight, Starts trying to haul him back into the fortress Antonia. Paul says to him, hey, can I talk to the people? So he lets him talk to the people. Paul speaks in Hebrew. When the Jews hear Hebrew, they're like, nice. And they all get quiet. And they hung on every word he said. I was on the road to Damascus. I was persecuting the church. I was dropped to my knees brighter than the daylight. I heard a voice, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? I'm Jesus. They just learned Jesus is risen. Whom you persecute. They're hanging on every word. And so he said, rise, I'm going to send you to the 
Gentiles. And as soon as the word Gentiles came out, the place broke out again, dust flying, the air clothes flying, people trying to claw at them. The Romans have to grab them like a phone pole, throw them on the shoulders, get them into the fortress Antonia. They figure out that he's a Roman. Whoops. Now Lysus, the commander, has got a problem, so he, well, we'll take him to the Sanhedrin the next day. So they bring him to the Sanhedrin, you know, the leadership of the Jews, stick him there in front of everybody, kind of looks around, reads the crowd, realizes this is not going to work, and basically says, hey, I'm a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee, I'm on trial for the hope of the resurrection. In other words, we all know Jesus rose from the dead. You guys paid some hush money to the Roman soldiers. Let's not pretend I'm here because he resurrected. The place erupts into a riot. Lysus has to pull him out of there, puts him back at the fortress Antonia. That night, Jesus appears to him, in case you thought he messed up. Be of good cheer, Paul. I got more for you to do, buddy. To paraphrase. A death threat comes at him. So they got to ship him out to Caesarea, leaving him with Felix, not the cartoon character. As some of you don't know. Felix has a wife, um, Drusilla. Drusilla is a granddaughter of Herod the Great, whom he <clears throat> stole from her husband. Apparently, she was drop dead gorgeous. And for two years, while keeping Paul under house arrest, Felix and Drusilla get to hear Paul come and talk to him about righteousness, judgment, repentance, getting right with God. He's preaching to the governor of the region of Judea, the procurator. Felix, analysis paralysis, does nothing with him, leaves him behind for Festus. Porcius Festus, by the way, I would stick with Festus. Festus takes over, doesn't know what to do with him, and King Agrippa II comes for a visit, diplomatic, with his sister Bernice in tow, sister to Drusilla. And Agrippa and Bernice are more than just brother and sister. She left her husband to be with them. See, you don't need daytime soaps. I mean, this is messed up. And Festus, wanting to write charges, gathers all the movers and shakers under his province into the theater we think at Caesarea, and Paul gets to give his defense. And Paul witnesses again that Jesus appeared on the road to Damascus. These guys actually let him finish. So he tells them, he has sent me to turn the Gentiles from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to the power of God. Well, basically, because he had to appeal to Caesar for a kangaroo court, they ship him to Rome. Took a little while. He gets to Rome, and as far as we can tell, somewhere before 64, summertime A.D., he actually has a hearing before Nero. Nero, the nut. Nero. After that meeting, he does get released, as far as we can tell, and eventually later rearrested. But it's not long after that, late 63, early 64, that Nero, if you look at history, really seemed to have gone nuts. In fact, on July 19, 64 AD, he sets Rome on fire. Most agree now it was an inside job. 10 out of 13 districts damaged, three completely destroyed. And the argument is because he wanted to rebuild it for his own glory. He immediately turns around and blames the Christians. And one of the things he does is wraps them in basically flammable cloth and sets them as torches in his garden. Was it perhaps being warned about the flames of the fire of hell if he didn't repent that kicked that off? See, there's a lot of things we get to learn in heaven. Just what did you witness to this dude, Paul, when you were in his presence? So Paul can now look as he's under arrest and realize that the things that look like they're against him are actually exactly what God had to do for him to fulfill the ministry he gave him to go to the Gentiles and to witness before kings, governors, and people of authority. That's why he's able to bow his knee. I'm right in the middle of God's will. So, you had a bad week? Things in your world blowing up? You've been accusing God of not caring for you? Met a tow truck driver or something, tow truck driver or something else this week that uh, you hadn't anticipated. How do you know it's exactly where he wants you to be? Maybe that's exactly what he's been trying to do in your world right now, and you're just fighting against it, telling him he doesn't love you. It's funny how that works, isn't it?
Paul's able to take one step back and go, you know, for this cause, I bow my knee under the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. I realize my tribulations have got a point. Of whom, verse 15, the whole family in heaven and earth is named. We're all in God's family because of our faith in Jesus Christ. He's the one who drew, drew us from darkness to light, and gave us forgiveness. That he would grant you according to the riches of his glory. That he would grant you to be strengthened with might. How? By his spirit in the inner man. And the only way you get his Holy Spirit in the inner man is when you trust in Jesus from your heart. You put your faith in Jesus. He gives you the Holy Spirit. We learned back in our last chapter as a down payment, as a promise, as an engagement ring of our future. He puts his presence in you by the spirit because one day he's going to bring you into his presence. It's a beautiful thing. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith so that you be strengthened by his spirit in the inner man. And the way to be strengthened in the inner man, again, comes back to know God's word, take time to pray, especially when temptation's after you. And a third strength that will renew you is worship or praise. Study King David. When things are bad, he starts praising. God delivers him. These things will strengthen your inner man or your inner woman in your walk with God. That you may be strengthened by or his, with his might by the spirit in the inner man. That Christ may dwell in your hearts, how? By faith, you trusted him, schooling the angelic realm. That ye being rooted and grounded in love, look at that, not theology, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth, length, depth, and height. Oh, I hated geometry. Let's slow down, will you? One of the seven wonders of the ancient world is the Temple of Diana. However, it's referred to as the Temple of Artemis in history. It is roughly, I think, 418 feet wide by 291 feet long, or wide, sorry, by 418 feet long, by 50 feet high with 100 columns. You want to talk a big structure with length, depth, breadth, and height. It would be that temple, and it sits in the town of Ephesus. So when he describes this, he goes, yeah, you see that temple of yours in town? Nothing compared to God's love. It outvolumes that. That you might know the love of Christ. There's that word love again. Which passes knowledge. Think of the road to Emmaus. Did not our hearts burn within us while we were with him? It passes knowledge. You may be filled with all the fullness of God, again, by his Holy Spirit. Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think. We can think some pretty cool things. But he goes beyond it. According to the power that worketh in us, again, his Holy Spirit. And as we work through this book, this book is going to encourage us about how we walk with the Holy Spirit. Unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. And the church said, Amen. we're out of time. Good, I'm glad you knew that. Let's stand and pray. I have to pick it up here next week. Father, we thank you for your word. Now I pray for anyone here that doesn't know you. Today is the day you can begin a relationship with God through the Son of God and his indwelling Holy Spirit. You don't have to come forward. You don't have to have a secret journey. Right where you stand, you need to ask his forgiveness. Right where you stand, if you open your heart, the Lord will come in. Lord, I ask that you would just show them their need for their forgiveness of their sins. That they would open their heart to you, Lord, and today would be the day they finally believe you sent your son he rose again. His shed blood pays for us that it would be the day they receive it. They ask you into their heart, Lord, and you would answer. And they would leave this place with your spirit living within them. And their lives would change. Lord, let the love of God truly come to those who are so lost. And they know it, Lord. They know how incredibly empty they are. May today be the day. Like those blind beggars, they cry out, have mercy on me, and leave here seeing. Thank you for all these things, Lord. We do pray again for this region of the Middle East. A lot of trouble is afoot. 
We ask that you would share yourself faithfully even in this time of chaos. In Jesus' name, amen.